Hey everyone, I'm Perry Williams. I'm John Reese Gilmer. I'm Mana Berg. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking to you about a book called Teaching Boys Who Struggle in School by Kathleen Palmer Cleveland. Uh, we're all currently undergraduate students uh, studying education with different emphasis. Uh, and we, we read this book uh, that discusses a little bit about why marginally boys do worse in school than females uh, in, in grad school, that is. To give a brief overview of Dr. Cleveland's book, basically it says, in recent years there has been a steady increase of studies that claim there is a crisis in boys' academic achievement and the decline is in boys from kindergarten through college. Some researchers support some findings that suggest that boys and girls learn differently based on their brain and their hormones and that they need to be taught differently and even if that means going back to separate same-sex schools. Palmer wrote this book in an attempt to help educators to get a, the real issue of who is underachieving, why are they struggling, and what educators do can do to respond to the students' needs. So basically, Palmer started her research by conducting a survey, um, asking classroom teachers, administrators, and counselors to answer questions such as, what, what do they hate about school? What do boys love about school? And then uh, the collective responses to, that she un uncovered, which there was four of them, um, things that included so things such as uh, social confidence, uh, lack of academic success, um, <clears throat> the struggle, boys struggling in uh, literacy skills, reading, and also um, the arrangement of the room, like lighting, seating, all that sorts of things. Palmer then goes on and uh, talks about learning styles and uh, the factors that influence boys. And she go talks about the Myers-Briggs uh, test and how um, the, the social, socially feeling um, is the one that um, boys struggle with the most. And then she goes on to give a pathway of how we can help uh, boys learn. And it's called the Pathways to Reengagement. And... Um, there's uh, this, the first one is support, which um, talking about teachers building trust and somebody that they can model after. Um, number two is guide, which is things such as clear, clear expectations, uh, feedback, and positive reinforcement in the classroom. Um, number three is reinforce, which are things talking about uh, communication and collaboration, uh, collaboration, things of that nature. Um, uh, pathway number four is adjust and adjust uh, things such as uh, zones of comfort, um, physical movement and interaction amongst uh, students in the classroom. Um, ignite is number five, which is just active learning and things of that nature in the classroom. And pathway six, which is empower. And it talks about engaging literacy um, building activities such as like you know taking t taking cards uh, enactments graphing graphic novels and that sorts of na th nature so those are the six pathways to reengage uh, to get boys back in uh, learning in the classroom okay so each of us uh, looked at a number of different articles for regarding the subject of, of boys that don't do well in school and while we each found three that really either were for or against it, there's one particular one that we, we focused on. So for me, I found a, a reading from the, uh, the Huffington Post called Six Reasons Why We Must Stop Blaming Teachers for Our Education System, or excuse me, Failing Education System, rather. Um, the author breaks down that, that essentially while America has the most people enrolled in college, uh, we are s fastly... Uh, backsliding and heading towards lower academic standards because we keep lowering the bar. So there are six reasons why, um, as, as the article says, that, that teachers, it's not their fault that we get into. And so the first one is the system. And the obvious thing that the author talks about is that the education system itself is a big business. And for this point, I personally agree uh, that there is a lot to blame with this system. You have people that don't actually teach, that are making laws, and they're making rules, and they're placing these on teachers and students that, are, that have never been in a classroom. They're not currently in a classroom. They don't understand how a classroom works. 
So you start to mix politics with actual education, and I think it fails um, often. And the second point, which I'm, I, I could argue for days, is that it's the student's fault. And to read you the actual quote that the Huffington Post um, uses is, some kids just aren't cut out for school. It doesn't matter how good of a teacher they uh, have or how much they inspire or motivate mo- or are motivated by their parents. Some kids just n- are ne'er-do-wells. I hate to say it, but it's the truth, and I like to speak the truth. I absolutely disagree with that. And I think that Cleveland, who often talks about how much it is the responsibility of the teacher and to never get up on give up on a child, uh, would disagree with that as well. I think that as educators, which ourselves being future educators, I think that it is it is 100% our responsibility to step up and take on that role and find what what motivates a child to get them to get them going and I can personally say that if if that had been the case for myself uh, I would be in a lot of trouble uh, I feel like I would probably never be anywhere close to working or getting a, a college degree or having a job above minimum wage and so I feel like that's that's a terrible way to look at it it's not just the student's fault there's a lot of things that are on the student but you have to you have to find a way to reach that child uh, the third point was it's their parents, and I 100% do agree with that. I think that a lot of learning takes place in the home, and uh, if if as a parent they're not investing in their child and their education, then there's something going on wrong. And I think that if that is taking place, then back to the, the fact that it's not on the student, it's on the teacher, because you never know what a child has going on at home. Um, societally is another one, the, the societal pressure that comes on uh with with learning and how people just don't it's not cool it's not cool to do it and there's so many more options outside of school or so it seems as a as a young student and so that's that's another point um keep it up and no one will teach you is the next one um and basically it just talks about again the politics and and what goes into to a teacher's job um And then the final point is maybe our expectations are too high. So the Huffington Post um, goes on to talk about how everyone thinks their children are uh, brilliant. And basically that people think that just because their their kids are their kids that they're the smartest. And instead, we expect too much of children, which I know that Palmer, or excuse me, Cleveland rather, she talks about heavily about the standards that we post on or that we put on children and how that there is a fine line of the bar that you you give a child whether you can't set it too high because you don't want to defeat them with failure but if you set it too low you don't want them to underachieve and do just enough to get by so i do think and especially as an educator like you have to set a a really fine line as to what is going to what you're going to expect of a child you push it but not too much so that way you motivate them to succeed and to to be better and so I think that there are no such thing as too high of expectations. You just have to incrementally place them on a child in order to raise their their awareness and their their goals themselves. Yeah, so the article I picked um, kind of piggybacks a little bit off of some of the points that were made in Perry's article, Six Reasons Why. Um, and I think it's interesting because in this entire discussion of um, boys' underachievement and the quote-unquote boys' crisis, um, a lot of the questions come back to who's, whose fault is it? Who do we blame? And subsequently, like, how can we fix it based on what that problem is? Um, and so the article I have is by Lisa Belkin, and it's for the New York Times. Um, it's called Whose Failing Grade Is It? And this article really focuses more on that one point of um, when things go wrong, do, can we really blame the child, and can we really blame the teacher, or does so much more of it have to do with um, what's going on at home? Because so much of a child's education does happen at home, um, especially younger in their lives. Um, and I think it's interesting that in in the in Dr. Cleveland's book, um, we don't really reach one steady, absolute conclusion of this is whose fault it is, this is what we need to do, Um, but all factors are acknowledged and I think that that's really the only stance that we can take because um, the context is so different for each person's education, each boy's education. Um, There is no one general rule that applies to every single student. Um, This 
this article, I think uh, Belkin puts it really well when she says, in the end, then, all these punish their parents paradigms will probably be will probably take their historical place as just one more shift of the pendulum in the sweep that already includes contradictory cer contradictory certainties like children are being allowed to grow up too quickly and children are being infantilized too long. Um, like every other new way of thinking, it will eventually be looked on as a well-intentioned but flawed reflection of a moment in time. And I think that's kind of a good summary of um, people will keep changing their minds about uh, who we should blame and what we should do um, in the search for truth and, and with good intentions, but there is no one strong uh, end-all, be-all answer to these kinds of questions. So yeah, in my article, um, it's called the, the Success of All Male Schools, and in this article, it talks about um, these uh, few um, all-male schools in Chicago and how they have a 100% graduation rate and um, how they also have a 100% college placement rate. And it talks. It also mentions how um, men fell out of school at a higher rate than women, and that how how important all male schools are to um, the learning of uh, males. And um, I believe this uh, ties in directly with uh, Dr. Palmer's um, book when she talks about um, cultural expectations, um, masculine identity, uh, the boy code. And in these things, it talks about, uh, in the masculine identity, it talks about boys, um, their, the code they have to live by, you know, such as like, they not, do not cry, um, do not ask for help, or, or sing or cry for joy, or even hug your, hug your closest friends. And um, I'm sure Perry can expand on this. Yeah, I think, I think that that was a huge thing. I know I can remember uh, as long ago as that was for me, being in, in elementary and even high school, uh, and probably more so in high school, the the thought of looking weak in front of people, uh, that was not something that you did. Um, you know, don't cry. God, men don't cry. Men don't cry. And men don't paint. Men don't do art. Men don't play music. Things like that. And and even, even with me, I went to a liberal arts high school. And while it was common for people to do that, you still... Um, one of the things that, that Cleveland talks about is is the idea of something looking gay. And that is huge in high school, especially. Everything is gay. If it's if it's something that is foreign to us, something that you know, I or John Reese, who both were athletes in high school, didn't like, it was gay. And myself, I grew up playing music, and that was something that you know you didn't do. And so I think that yeah, the there's definitely there is a boy code that is very real, and it, and furthermore, it's even it's very harsh, and it's it's a hard idea to uh, to conquer. Um, it's not something that you want to go against, and uh, Cleveland talks about the SF um, mentality and from the Myers Briggs test and how that's the hardest one for them because they they are different. They do they do different things. They see things different. So yeah, I think that that the boy code uh, is it's it's cancerous even uh, to go as far as saying that it, it's 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 heavy on high school boys' minds and that is a distraction from learning because these students that have that learn in certain ways, they're not going to be able to, to conquer that just because of the societal norms that are put on them. So, Yeah, I also really appreciated um, the part in the book about the boy code uh, that Dr. Cleveland included. Um, because, I mean, obviously I know that there are, like, cultural pressures on males and the masculine identity and everything, but of course as a female I'm never going to fully totally understand that and internalize it so I really liked to read about that perspective uh, especially um where it says don't ask for help um because I in my mind if it's stigmatized to ask for help then kind of as a, a sublet of that um it's stigmatized to even need help and how poisonous that would be for a young boy's mind to to think that if they even needed help or were thinking about asking for help that that somehow made them inferior or um, anything like that. I was intrigued. Sweet. So, okay. So to close it out, I'd kind of like to, to see everybody's different perspective and hear what they had to say. So my, my personal one to, to blame with the personal thing to blame for why boys struggle in school. Uh, I have to go, I would say the teacher. John Reese, who would you say? I would definitely have to go with the, the parents. Okay. Well, just cause I want to refute that. Why? Why do you want to go with the parents? Because I can say for certain that I've had 
throughout my years in um, school that I've had some great teachers, but even in those great teachers' classrooms, I still struggled. And if it wasn't for my parents and their support system and my mom staying up late every single night tutoring me and things, there I I wouldn't be here today. I would I would have just barely made it out of high school and my GPA would not have been what it was. And that's you know, my mom stayed up and tutored me every single night, and it had nothing to do with how great the teacher was or what they did in the classroom to accommodate me or anything. It was my parents and their support system and them helping me get through things that the, even the teacher couldn't help me with. So you're saying so essentially that, like, if if that child doesn't have that support system at home, then they, it's, it's, they're destined to fail. So... I, because I mean, like, so what you're like, just to clarify, because yeah, so if if a student doesn't have the the, the parent backing them, then they're destined to fail. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So I'm gonna take I, I take the, the stance of the teacher and not to leave out man. I promise I'll bring you in just <laughs> a second. Um, I I think that because uh, societally and not to pass judgment on anybody's life and, or sound like I'm judging anyone, but there's there's a great deal in this country and the the Huffington article talked about it. Um, about kids that don't have um, that that influence at home, and you know, you always hear these stories about oh, there's these kids that that come out of you know these terrible low end socioeconomic you know places with no parents. They they grow up on the streets, things of that nature, um, and they make something awesome of themselves. And I, I I feel like in every one of those stories, you always have this great teacher. So I personally would say the teacher. Um, it's the teacher's fault because if, if every child can be met somewhere and I feel like if you can meet a child, no matter how long it takes, how hard, how hard you have to try. And it doesn't necessarily have to be even in your subject area. You know, you meet them on a personal level, you hold a relationship with them, you mentor them. And I think that's, that is one of the biggest things as a teacher is you are supposed to mentor a child. And I I think that Cleveland talks about that a lot, about the relationship you're supposed to have with, with a child and, and, you know, inside and outside the classroom. And so I, I personally think it's, you know, even if the parents aren't there, a teacher can still make the difference. So without a teacher who cares and will motivate and will put in that overtime uh, to make a difference in a child's life, you're, you'll never have success. So with that being said, uh, Mana, who would, you, who would you say? Well, I mean, I think I agree with both of you and disagree with both of you. And I think that's just because I, I don't think there is one answer. As I said earlier, I think... Every child is so different. Every every student as a learner is so different. Um, and home situation... I mean, as both of you guys have said, I, I just don't know if there is one end-all, be-all answer for who's to blame when students underachieve. Because um, I think so much of it just differs so widely based on the situation. Sweet. Okay, well, uh, that's it for us, guys. So don't forget, uh, the book is called Teaching Boys Who Struggle in School. It's by Kathleen Palmer Cleveland. Uh, That's going to be it for us. Thanks for joining us and hanging out.